I have the honor today to present this year's advocacy award to Jamika Hodnett, and um, I think she's going to be a shero to all of us soon here. Uh, Jamika is a champion of climate justice and has served throughout her career in different positions, including as the national director of campaigns at Dream.org, the founder and executive director of Rise to Thrive. Executive Director of Climate Equity at AB Partners, and as the Deputy National Organizing and Campaigns Director at the ACLU um, National. In August, Jamika took a new role, which is really exciting, and became the um, Chief Programs Officer at the Chisholm Legacy Project. Uh, and their mission is to connect black communities on the front lines of climate justice with resources to traverse the path from vision to strategy, to action plan and to implementation, and from there to transformation. Jamika has a JD from the University of the District of Columbia, the David A. Clark School of Law, and a BA in International Affairs and Climate Policy from Trinity University. I was honored to speak with Jamika on Saturday. We had a nice long conversation and talk about her career and her passion for climate justice and energy equity. She grew up in the mountains of Appalachia and as a little girl she enjoyed hiking and climbing and playing in creeks and being outdoors and any of her spare time. And she says that her grandmother was really an extraordinary inspiration to her, taking her on walks and talking to her about how important it is to take care of the natural environment. And she taught her that you have to do that with your community, starting with your community. And I hold that very dear. Um, she learned about helping other people recognize the ability to affect change was so important and it was really impactful to empower others. And she told me that she and her grandparents would uh, campaign together in their town for the NAACP. So how lucky was she to have a family that, that taught her this from such a young age. She won her first writing contest um, in fifth grade and says that at the age of 11, she already knew that she wanted to use her skill in life as a writer to change people's lives. And she wanted to focus on writing about justice, pollution, and poverty. She says that as a curious child, she was trying to figure out how to make this passion into a career, which she's obviously done, and we'll hear more about that from her. Her advocacy in these areas has been profound, and I'm really excited to, do, to see what she'll do in her future. Um, I asked her what one of her favorite pieces of legislation was that she'd worked on, and she said that it was uh, when she was working for Solar for All in D.C., she she helped in her involvement of Solar for All in D.C., which uh, gave 100,000 low-income houses solar power. And um, I just want to say I'm really impressed with your extraordinary energy, with your dedication, and with all your great grassroots work and work in the community. So in closing, I'd just like to say that in her words, the sky's the limit for the just transition to the clean energy economy. And I know that she will continue with this passion as she moves forward. Congratulations so very much for this, Jamaica. So it's just so great to be here with so many amazing women working on clean energy. I'm just so honored um, to, to get this recognition. It feels so good to be recognized, honestly. Um, I've just been working extremely hard and I've been extremely dedicated uh, to this work. Um, and so, yeah, just being here today is like a very um, wonderful full circle moment for me. So I'm pretty much a person that marches to the beat of my own drum. That's just who I am. So, you know, when I got involved in climate advocacy and environmental justice, it was a no-brainer that I was going to be a person that stuck my neck out. I was going to be a person that made connections on the ground in communities. And I was going to do work um, that really impacted people's lives. And I always wanted to feel a sense of accountability to the communities that I was working with. And I pretty much carried that spirit um, with me throughout all of the work that I've been doing. My vision for clean energy um, is 
ultimately for it to be accessible, affordable, and for every family across America to be able to have access to it, regardless of race or socioeconomic status or class. And really, the way that I've been doing that is making connections on the ground, building relationships with local leaders. And really, I lean a lot into education, right? So um, some of my work is I'll go into a community or neighborhood and I might be talking to a mayor and they're like, well, what is this clean energy stuff about? And I'm like, well, let me tell you about it. <laughs> and I go into a whole spiel and really dig into it. And I noticed that, you know, what I bring to those conversations is not just the sense of um, I know all the things or, uh, uh, or that I'm talking down to someone, but ultimately I'm pretty open because I think that I can teach someone something and that they can teach me something back. And so what they have to bring and offer is a perspective of their, their direct community and their direct constituents. And so um, I try to bring that in when I'm having a conversation about clean energy. Really, um, that means for me uh, being an influential advocate and advocacy for me means that we have to lean into educating communities, informing decision makers, and in theory, getting on the proverbial soapbox. In my work every day, that's what I'm doing as an advocate. That means being clear in my communication, clear in my approach, open and flexible to different opinions and attitudes, and willing to engage in and build relationships across differences. That's sometimes easier said than done, especially when I think I'm right all the time. <laughs> it also means being will willing to build with others to achieve a common purpose. And for me, that has meant sticking my neck out, even when it's uncomfortable. There was a time in my career, actually, when I was meeting with a uh, senator that shall not be named, but I was asked by the <laughs> by the organization I was working with not to say climate change and I was like are we being serious you want me to go and talk about a meeting where I'm talking about climate change and you you don't want me to say climate change <laughs> yes <laughs> um, and so I got all the way through the meeting I'm talking about clean energy talking about clean energy prospects talking it up and I'm like uh, I'm gonna say the thing you're gonna say the thing Jamaica say it now <laughs> And I said it, and it didn't go so bad, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to say I fully uh, converted him to being a believer, but, uh, you know, I don't feel like that any of us got here in this room today by not having difficult conversations and, not, and by not sticking out, right? Like, we are women working in the clean energy sector. We are by far uh, trailblazers. And of course, we're not going to say no, and we're gonna dig in. And so um, again, like I'm just feeling that energy in this room. For me, um, you know, this is difficult work and Advancing it really requires, again, like I said, the relationship building piece. Uh, and then really in the relationship building piece, it's really thinking through, okay, how can we make sure that we're not leaving any community behind? I believe that's really through a lot of the historic invest investments that we have coming down the pipeline. And so of course the Inflation Reduction Act really the way that I talk about it when I go out into communities, I'm, I talk to them and I say, this is an opportunity to revitalize your community, revitalize your workforce, and really to think about the transition in a different way, in a way that, you know, it's not just for affluent people, but Biden and the Biden administration has really sort of put this, this, this money out there for communities on the ground so that people can take advantage of it in the way that they know how. And, really 
that means for me not going in with a one-size-fits-all narrative about what a community needs, what sort of energy source they want to have access to, any of those things. It's about really listening and taking to account, okay, this is the greenhouse gas reduction analysis that I'm doing for you. What, what sort of community projects would best benefit your community? And I'm really doing that right now with the African American Mayors Association. And so one of the things I'm doing is we have a cohort of mayors, mostly from EPA Region 4. And those mayors, we, we intentionally picked mayors from places where, um, where the population size is lower, um, under 100,000 residents. And the reason we did that is so, um, and so basically we are going after mayors that might not necessarily have a chief sustainability officer. And so, you know, when I'm in, engaged in those sort of conversations and I'm talking to them, I'm really going in and trying to figure out what is the best pathway forward for your city and for your community. And they seem to be really open to those processes. And another way that I'm doing it is really trying to influence racial equity and inf infuse racial equity into the climate finance space. And so that's working primarily with the African American Alliance of CDFI CEOs and really trying to get that, that capital to communities that need it most that have not been invested in in the past. So I can absolutely say my work is to bring as many people along as possible in the clean energy transition and working directly with the leaders to ensure those benefits of the intended investments reach the communities that need it most. Really for me, from Appalachia to the deep south, I'm making connections and planting seeds for possibilities because the only way this all works is through relationships, connection, and community. Thank you.